it's loading. I'm gonna have to make sure I have the sound turned off once it cuts to YouTube. Okay. Um, okay. Seems good, we are now live. Hello everybody and welcome to Discovery Adventures. Um, I am at home, but my collaborator, Jeff, is actually in the museum today on all of our adventures. We're gonna be able to take you into the museum, looking at things from our collection and going on a journey of discovery to learn more about them. This is a live program and there is the chat ability on um, that YouTube page. So please feel free to chat us any comments or questions you may have on our journey. Today's theme, we are looking at wild Chicago. What are the animals that live here and what can we learn about them? And Jeff, what are some of those animals you've got right there with you? Excellent, yeah, let's talk about these, Anna. So welcome everyone. I'm very happy to be able to be at the museum and show this to you. Um, we are closed currently, but because there aren't guests here, I'm able to go maskless right now. And we are currently looking at a couple of birds that live maybe not so much in the city, but at least out in the suburbs or in central Illinois or further south. So we've got a wild turkey here, and we also have the smaller one, which is a ring-necked pheasant. And we're gonna talk a little bit about native versus not native species. But first, I would like everyone to go ahead and if you would like to put in our chat where you are viewing from, just real quick, and then also, one animal that you've seen, maybe a really unique one or maybe a common one, kind of roaming around your yard or neighborhood in the past couple months. So one of your local native species. And we'll see what we get. So while you guys are weighing in, I'm going to think of something that I have seen lately. And one of my favorites are these little birds called red-breasted nuthatches. And they love to come to my feeder and hop around in the trees. They're the little guys that can almost hang upside down and eat. So they're a lot of fun to watch. Anna, what about you? I'm trying to think. I haven't been outside the last couple of days, but some of the animals I've seen recently near the lakeshore where I live, I um, saw a vole right along the kind of cement steps out there, which was very exciting. Um, <laughs> There's also animals in my apartment, so I see pigeons a lot too. Nice. Yeah, let me know if we're getting any audience responses as to who's seen different things around their neighborhood as well. Yeah, so, yeah we're going to talk about what does live around the city of Chicago and maybe as far as what has adapted really well to city life. So I think one of our responses is a good example of something that's adapted well to both like urban and forest environments. Um, there's first graders from Chicago and they have seen bunnies. Yes. Oh, excellent. Yes. The cottontail rabbit or the bunnies, they adapt quite well to both urban or city life and rural or suburban life. Cool. Any other good ones, Anna? Um, just a good morning from Calvin. Hey, Calvin. Hey, good morning, Calvin. So yeah, let's real quick talk about what is native versus non-native versus an invasive species, if you've ever heard of that. So Anna's gonna pop up a slide real quick to show you three animals. And we'll talk a little bit about that just to introduce. But a native species is an animal that is native to the area. It has an established population. It's been there since probably before humans have been there. And a good example of a native species is the one you see there, the garter snake. And garter snakes are native to this area. Raise your hand or give a yes if you've ever seen a garter snake around. Garter snakes are native creatures. That is something that you can see around here and have been able to for a long time. Non-native would be a creature that it was introduced or maybe brought here by humans or perhaps stowed away and came here, but it doesn't, it wasn't native. It hasn't been here a long time. And then there's this other invasive. And an invasive would be a non-native species that also has kind of gotten maybe too many as far as its population and maybe causing some issues or some negative impacts on the ecosystem. 
So that's how I'm going to kind of differentiate those two. The non-native you see there is a parakeet, a monk parakeet. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, they live in Chicago, which is really weird, but they don't cause a lot of problems. The one on the far side you see there is the brown rat. And if you live in the city, it's likely you may have encountered or seen one of these. So those are the rats that came over from well, Europe, and I think they may have originally been from Asia, I'm not sure. But they have spread out widely and have really taken over things. So that would be an invasive species. So one of our other comments, Clementine sees a lot of blue herons in Naperville. That's an example of a native species, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. Great blue herons are awesome. Yeah, see those out in the suburbs, wonderful. Yeah, and Christina's first graders have seen um, garter snakes in Chicago. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they kind of keep to themselves or a little secretive, but I'm really happy to hear that you've seen them in Chicago. That's great that they've been able to uh, kind of adapt a little bit to that. Well, some other animals have been able to adapt too to city life in Chicago. So humans, as we spread out across the planet and we make cities and different communities, animals that can adapt to that kind of life are probably gonna do quite well, generally. And the city of Chicago, one of the biggest cities in our nation, has some animals that have adapted well to city life. So we're gonna talk about those today, and we're gonna start with some birds. So first off, as you can see behind me again, there is the wild turkey. And the wild turkey is a fairly large bird that has kind of reestablished itself in a lot of areas in Illinois. Now, they're not common at all to see in the city, but you can see them out in the suburb, suburbs and further out. But that turkey, actually one was spotted last year in, I believe it was the Northtown neighborhood, but in Chicago and maybe even along the lakefront. It was seen on someone's balcony at one point, I think. So even wild turkeys are making an effort to come back. Now, we've got something here to show you. And I'm going to grab, do it that. There we go. Grab my little flashlight and real quick show you this wing. So this is actually a wing from a wild turkey. And I'm going to kind of shine my flashlight and try to turn it a little bit. This is a male's wing. If you see those feathers, the smaller ones at the top as I turn it, it's a little tough to see here. If I had better lighting, you'd see it better. They're iridescent. As you turn the wing, what do you notice, Anna? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> it's kind of, I see a shine to it as I turn it. Yeah, it's like, sorry, there's a tail in my face. Oh. <laughs> there is a really nice kind of shimmer there. And it's actually something that I see on my, um, oops, my pigeon birds as well. So that's like that iridescence when you've got that really cool ability to reflect light and some different color wavelengths. Yeah. So Anna, pigeons are another bird that has adapted very well to city life. They, they certainly have. <laughs> <laughs> and even maybe <laughs> apartment life, but yes, Anna's got some pigeons there. So yeah, pigeons have adapted very well. Think of any other birds you might, like sparrows might have seen around, but there is a bird that's really, really interesting that has adapted well to city life, even better than the turkey because this bird actually lives in the city proper. So let me grab it. Okay. So I'm gonna try to get a good angle. There we go. You can see that bird. Nice. Yeah. I don't know what that bird is. Is that the peregrine falcon? It is the peregrine falcon. And Anna, what do you notice about its beak? Do you notice anything interesting? Um, I mean, it's a really kind of tall, thick beak, like a lot of birds, like hummingbirds have a very narrow beak, but even something like a robin has a much smaller beak um, that's like not that big and powerful looking. Yes, that beak looks very powerful. And this falcon, it is um, protected, the specimen is protected inside the tube here, but you can see it is very sleek looking. So this peregrine falcon is actually the fastest animal on the planet. And if uh, any of you joined us, we did talk a little bit about a peregrine falcon in a previous discovery adventure. But the neat thing about this peregrine falcon is it has adapted to living in the city of Chicago. So the peregrine falcon traditionally nests on cliffs. Now we don't have cliffs in the city of Chicago, 
But if you know what the Spelkin might use instead of a clip, go ahead and chat that to Anna and I. And while I talk a little bit more about the Spelkin, we'll see if anyone knows where they might like to make their nests. So in the spring, I believe it's around March or April, maybe they start to lay eggs and then the babies hatch. You can actually tune into the falcon cams to see them. But yeah, the falcon will be soaring through the air. And if it sees its prey, it can fold its wings and it can go into its dive, which I always forget the name of. And if you remember the name? A uh, stoop, isn't it? I was gonna say a steep or a stoop. Yeah, a stoop. It goes into its stoop and it can reach over 200 miles an hour. And that falcon, is aiming for other birds. So they eat other birds, including maybe pigeons. And Anna, have we gotten any responses as to where these might live? I haven't gotten any responses yet, no, to where they might live. Okay. But because they do live in the city, one of their major food sources is my friend right here. Um, so, oh, here we go. Clementine has seen those falcons on skyscrapers, which is so cool. I, for one, have not. Um, seen a falcon in the city. I'm always looking because I'd like to see one. I'd like to see it relatively far away from me because I, or not necessarily, I'd like to be close to it. I need them to be far away from my apartment because these guys would be great snacks for falcons. <laughs> I your eyes pigeons as I hold this up. All right, so those are examples of some birds that might live in the city of Chicago. And we've got one more really quick to talk about. And Anna's gonna put a slide. Yeah. So don't have a specimen. It's an interesting little bird. It's something you wouldn't expect in the city of Chicago. Actually, a parakeet. So about a century ago, they went extinct. There was a small parakeet called the Carolina parakeet, and they would live around this area. They were actually native. They went extinct. Now, when something goes extinct, it leaves that kind of space or that niche in the ecosystem, and something else can come along to fill it. Well, there was a parakeet, that had that little niche in the ecosystem. As these guys, as the uh, Carolina parakeets went extinct, there was kind of that opening there. And in later in the last century, some monk parakeets, not native to this area, happened to get loose. And we're not sure exactly how that happened. There's lots of different rumors and theories, but these monk parakeets got loose. And you can see them now in the city of Chicago. I think they live in some other cities as well, like San Francisco. There may be some Toronto or New York, I'm not sure, but we definitely have flocks of little parakeets in Chicago, which is really weird. You would think they're more of like a tropical bird, but you can actually see monk parakeets. So if you look it up online, you may be able to find some spots to see these guys. Really, really cool. Parakeets. So cool. Yeah. Anna, have we gotten any good questions or our responses? Um, let me check. I have a hard time seeing the chat when I'm sharing the screen. Oh, Clementine has seen the parakeets in Hyde Park by MSI. That's super close to me. So I need to like look for those because I would like to see these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I've heard Hyde Park is one of the places to see them. Absolutely. Very cool. So I need to make a quick move with our cart to our next destination. So Anna, I think you've got a trivia question for our guests. Yes, so let me share my screen again, and we'll ask the question of what animal has adapted really well to living on the lakefront in the city. So this is an animal you may be seeing. It's not the monk parakeet. It's on the next slide. So it'll be a surprise for a second. And actually, I guess on that note, maybe I'll stop sharing my screen for a second so that you can see my face and not the parakeet. Um, but there's of course a lot of birds that have adapted really well to the city. Pigeons are one of them because their history is also being a domestic bird. Not everyone knows that, but pigeons are one of the most early um, domesticated species, especially for looks. People were breeding them to have like different kind of show and fancy qualities, something we also see people have done with dogs as an example. Um, so not a function like how horses or um, meat birds, like animals that we use to do labor or to eat have had functions, but we have used pigeons for a long time as like fancy looking birds. Of course, they were also meat birds before that. Oh, and Calvin has also seen the parakeets a few times and has noticed they're always in groups and never alone. That's a really good observation. A lot of animals and especially a lot of birds are social and stay in big groups. And you'll actually see that in this question of like what animal has adapted really well to living on the lakefront. Um, that is another social animal. So you usually see a lot of them together. People don't necessarily like them. They're supposed to be migratory. 
but sometimes they stick around for a really long time, longer than we sometimes want them to. So I haven't gotten an answer yet about what animals live on the lakefront, but Jeff has gotten to another really cool water dwelling animal. Oh, here we go. Calvin has guessed seagulls and Christina guessed ducks or swans. I think all of those are pretty valid answers. Yeah, they are. There's one I was thinking of that is even a little bit more common and to me a little bit more overpopulated. And when I'm running on the lakefront, I really got to watch where I step. Yep. It's these guys, the Canadian geese, but those are also very good examples as well. Yep. Our audience is listed, but those geese, those geese really are everywhere. Yes, they are. Now, this is an animal behind me that you might not see everywhere. We've got a little bit of a glare. I'm gonna try to correct for that a bit here and zoom in closer with it. You can see a little animal on top of kind of a mound of reeds or grasses, and that is a muskrat. So there are muskrats around, and I believe you can see them at times swimming in the river. So yeah, muskrats, I'm gonna get one out because I have a specimen that you can see a little better. And scoot back here so you can see their mound. Got all sorts of cool stuff over here to bring over. Yeah. Just a good view and we it. did have a couple of people that did say geese. Clementine and Kawania guest geese and Julie oh, nice. eagles. Yeah. That's a really cool specimen there. There we go. You can see its little face there. This is a muskrat. So it's actually, Anna mentioned voles earlier. Voles are usually little tiny critters, but this muskrat is kind of an aquatic vole. It's actually more related to a vole than a rat, but it's got a long tail like a rat. And unlike a beaver, it's gonna be hard to show, but they've got this tail that is more vertically oriented. You can see how thin it is there. It's not like a beaver's tail that's flat. So this tail is kind of goes up and down and that can help propel the muskrat a little bit. It's also got these huge feet right there we go for swimming. And these guys are great swimmers, but if you ever see a little head, kind of a brown head sticking out of the water swimming along and it's not real big, it's likely not a beaver. It's probably one of these little guys, a muskrat. So this is a neat native species that lives around Illinois and does live in the city. And then there's another aquatic animal that is really, really cool. One of my favorites that I'm gonna get a pelt from that lives close, close to the city of Chicago. And while Jeff is getting that pelt, there's another aquatic animal too. It is fun to think about. We'll do a trivia question about that in a minute, but look at that. Oh my goodness, that looks really soft. It is extremely soft. And I've definitely felt it without gloves on too. This pelt, this fur is extremely soft and thick. I can feel it on my arm now. And let me get really close. I'm gonna to try to hold it very still and pull the fur apart. Can you see any, can you see the under fur there, Anna? It's yeah, like a lighter, like, softer fur. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of down. Yeah, it's extremely soft. So it's like an extra layer of fur. So this animal is a river otter. And river otters were very, very rare in the state of Illinois, probably in the 1980s. They used to be all around. So they're a native animal that was almost extinct in the state of Illinois, but they've been reintroduced. So sometimes a native animal can be reintroduced and if it's still got an ecosystem to move back into, it can reestablish a population and come back. Now otters love clean water and of course they love not being caught in traps. Unfortunately, those are two things that had happened in the past. Otters were trapped for this beautiful fur and the rivers got a lot more polluted. And I wouldn't want to eat fish out of a dirty river. So these otters either found better places to live or had died out. Now when they were reintroduced, they've kind of moved back into pretty much every county in the state. And they've been seen in the north branch of the Chicago River. And so that is a good sign that our rivers are starting to get a little bit cleaner. And if we keep working on them, Anna, what do you think? Wouldn't it be cool to see an otter in the city? I would love to see an otter in the city. And also um, Rebecca of the Mammal Collection has noted that it's really cool that their fur is waterproof. And this is something that helps keep them warm in the winter and cool in the summer. It also makes sense why people really like that fur. It has some really cool qualities. It's helpful for the otter though, so they can survive. 
we don't necessarily need as much. Yeah, that beautiful fur there. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that, uh, that layer under is kind of like when you wear a heavy coat, you've got that insulation in there, but the outside keeps you dry. So that's a good way to think of it. Wonderful. Well, Anna has another trivia question for you while I get our next animal ready and I will let them do that. Yeah, so for our next thoughtful trivia question, um, does anyone remember the animal or the name of the specific animal that was found in Chicago waters last summer? It was a non-native species. Um, it was not pervasive. They're not gonna start a population. I've only known of one to show up in Illinois. Uh, it had a very catchy name although they considered many names i believe over twitter one of the suggested names was croc obama but that was not the one they picked anyone remembers that really thrilling guest star and it really is another important note of why it's important to not release pets because some animals become invasive like red-eared slider turtles um, which then compete with native turtles but um yeah the <laughs> This animal was only one, so it was okay. Yeah. Oh, Clementine also asked if otters hibernate, and Rebecca, who works with our mammal collection, says they do not hibernate. Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't hibernate, how do they survive in the cold months? But it seems like if they have their really thick fur, that's probably got to help, I would mm -hmm. And I've um, heard... And Clementine also guessed the alligator for ah. trivia, and that is correct. Let me... Nope a picture real fast of our alligator friend it was none other than chance the snapper uh chance the snapper we have two species there actually anna oh yes and then there's the mallard, and i love how close they are together these mallard ducks do not seem to be bothered by this predator from no. <laughs> chance the snapper non-native and the mallard with young native it is an interesting picture and yeah, I have heard with otters that winter is one of the better times to see them because they are out and active and their dark fur can stand out sometimes if they're near the snow. Wonderful. Well, good job, those who got Chance the Snapper. That was a nice little throwback to last year. So I've got two things here. There are also some reptiles and amphibians that live around Chicago. And because we're getting a little short on time, I'm just going to show you a couple quick amphibians. And amphibians would be things like frogs or salamanders. There are plenty of those around. So this is a great example of a skeleton of a frog. This is a bullfrog skeleton. What do you notice about that, Anna? Oh, you're muted. I'm muted. Um, it's got some really long toes. Yeah. That's the things I notice, long toes, long legs, very flat head. Yeah. Definitely looks like an animal that uses its legs and is a good jumper. Bullfrogs, I believe, can jump eight feet. Is that correct? Or 10 feet, eight to 10 feet? Yeah, they're they are pretty impressive. Yeah, and you look at its size. It's a decent sized frog, but that's a great jump. Now there's another frog that I find even more interesting because of its habit. Now I'm gonna show you this little guy. Hopefully you can see it. Yeah, look at that little guy. Pretty cute. That is a wood frog. So this little wood frog does something extra special. Now, Chicago, think about how it is outside and right now. It's not too bad, but think about how it gets in the winter. It's pretty cold. It's pretty cold. It gets really, really cold sometimes. And that's tough for little things like amphibians that have that softer skin. A lot of them will burrow into the mud and will hibernate. But this frog called the wood frog takes it a step further. And there's actually, there are videos you can look up online or on YouTube, and I would recommend it to see these frogs unfreeze. Because what they do when it gets cold, they actually freeze pretty much solid. Most of them freezes. And the, basically the cells kind of stop even communicating between the cells. This animal enters a state of pretty much suspended animation. So the heart is effectively stopped, the breathing stops, and this frog is frozen during the cold months. They can even live as far north as Alaska, and they can freeze for six or seven months up there, I believe, scientists have found. And yeah, when it gets so to it be- spends half of the year frozen? In a frozen state, yes. That's wild. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah, this little frog right here, the wood frog, there it is. 
And then when spring comes around, it thaws out and the frog starts to move and then its little eyes open and it can go hop around and find a mate and get some food for the next winter when it needs to freeze again. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. Because a lot of animals, you know, people were asking about the, the otter hibernating. A lot of animals do become less active. Um, and even if they're less active because they're like saving energy and not moving around as much because there's less food, you will still see them like otters because they have to eat unless they completely shut down like the wood frog. That is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's really incredible. So Anna, we're going to do a couple more animals with our time left. And I kind of want to, I want to address like how we know about these creatures in Chicago and how we can learn more about them. And one is birds. Now this is a bit of a sad story, but it does have some nice hope to it. It's that in Chicago, we have a lot of buildings and a lot of big windows. We also have a lot of birds that love to use this area as a migratory route. They come through on their migrations. So you can guess that's not a good combination. Oftentimes those birds will run into windows and some of them will be killed. There's actually Chicago bird monitors, um, volunteers who go around and they look for these birds during migratory season in the morning. And if the bird is still alive, they might take it and to a nature facility and hope to rehab it. If it's dead, they would bring it right away to the museum to be preserved as a specimen. And that is a way to get specimens and study, but also to record where those birds were. Maybe the certain buildings are more dangerous. And then there's this initiative. I'm gonna get some birds and Anna, would you like to tell a little bit about the initiative, The Lights Out? Yeah, so one of the things they've been able to figure out as we collect data about where these birds are hitting windows, they figured out that when buildings have their lights off, there are less bird collisions. And now we can actually see some of those really beautiful birds that Jeff has just pulled up here. Mm -hmm. um, so now they've done a lot of work to communicate with buildings to ask them to turn out their lights. And as they have done that, it has actually reduced the amount of collisions at those buildings. Um, so it's really cool. The more we're able to like investigate a problem, the more we can build out a solution. And now Jeff can talk about these awesome birds. Yeah. No, thank you, Anna. That was great. And right, that, so there's solution involved. We're hoping to be able to help some of these birds. Most of these do migrate through. Now the blue jays I've seen year round and robins are starting to stick around longer. I've seen some of those around in the winter, but most of these come through and may stick around for the summer like a red-winged blackbird or may just migrate through. Now this one is one of my favorites, this beautiful little blue bird. And if you've learned about blue, you might know it's not really blue, but it's a little trick of the light. This little guy is an indigo bunting and they're beautiful little birds. Definitely look for them in the summer, they are around. Got some warblers and other birds here. But yeah, these are, a lot of these are actual collision birds collected at different areas. Um, so like this little, the beautiful little one with the orange throat is from 120 South Riverside. It's, I believe, a Blackburnian warbler. And that address lets us know, well, this was found around there. Maybe we can work with that building to help with the lights out. One more animal, one of my absolute favorites. Ooh. These are going to be really cool animals coming up. And for the people that have seen the um, the parakeets by MSI, I've seen indigo behind MSI on Wooded Island. Um, so if you're looking for indigo buntings, I've seen them there a few times, which is really exciting. OK, we have a nose. While I start to talk about this, I want to see if people can figure out what animal I have the pelt for here. I know it's a little tough to tell, but please chat if you think you know what this animal is. And we'll give you some hints as we go along. But a lot of people have trouble figuring out exactly what this is. Let's take a look. It's a fairly large creature. It has a bushy tail. We don't have the legs attached to this study skin, so we don't actually get to see those. But again, look at the nose. It looks fairly dog-like. It's got some little whiskers there. It's got kind of a pointy snout. And it's kind of hard to see the ears, but the ears would also be somewhat pointy. So this is an animal that is adapted very, very well to city life and sometimes surprises people that it lives right in the heart of Chicago. But it's one of my favorites for that reason. And Anna, just let me know if we start getting any guesses or any responses. Got yeah, I think people are still thinking through that. We did have um, a question about how having the lights off 
prevent birds from flying into the window. Mm -hmm. What I have heard is that um, a lot of the birds are actually migrating very early in the morning when it's still dark out. And that creates um, for them an impression that it's like the lights in the sky, like the stars. Um, so it's issues perceiving it not as like an object, but as like a weird version of the sky that they can fly into. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if you know anything else about it, Jeff. Yeah, I don't know a lot about it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's, I believe it's because they do navigate by light and it throws them off. The city lights throw them off. But why the windows exactly, I'm not sure. Um, it, why they're flying exactly towards them. I would have to yeah. read a little bit more on that, but I think it does have to do with navigation. Yeah, we do have some guesses now about the yeah. belt you're holding. Um, so Clementine guessed a badger and Christine was thinking a wolf or a fox. Those are great guesses. Oh, we're so close. Wania, Clementine and Marion have now all said, and Jillian, coyote. Coyote, yes. So this is a coyote. Yeah, I believe there are foxes around too. You wouldn't see wolves, but this is a coyote. And coyotes are really, really incredible creatures. They have adapted very well to life in the city of Chicago. And one of the reasons we know this is there's an urban coyote project in Chicago and they actually track coyotes. So they will get them with a, a dart and tranquilize them, put them to sleep for just a little while, put a collar on the coyote, and then they can track the coyote around. So you can see on your screen here, there's a coyote. It's not dead, it's just, it's kind of like a little dazed because it's been put kind of to sleep. They're putting a collar on it. And then you can see the one running there. They just released it and it's taken off. It's got a collar on it. And you can see the one on the far side with uh, our other creature we talked about, which is kind of overpopulated, the Canada geese. And the coyotes will actually, I believe, eat goose eggs and they may hunt the young geese. So it helps keep the population down. They also hunt something else. There was an invasive species we talked about at the very beginning. And if anyone knows it, please chat it. It's something that coyotes hunt very frequently in the city of Chicago, that coyotes are really helpful as far as eating these animals. So think back to the very beginning and what was that invasive species that's all over the city? Coyotes will eat them. But yeah, one of the neat things as you're thinking about that and responding is that with these radio collars, the scientists can track where the coyotes go and learn about their actual habitats. And here we've got one coyote. This is coyote number 748 on your screen, not this one. And that coyote, you can actually see these little dots are different pings from the radio collar of where it was found via the radio and not just sighted. So you can actually get an idea of that coyote's range right down along the lakefront. And Anna, yeah, can you kind of show about where the museum's at? Oh yeah, let me find that little laser pointer feature. But what's really cool about it, so let me see, is this Northerly Island here? Is that right? I believe it is in the Navy That's Pier. That's Navy Pier. Yeah, so it. the museum would be right over here. So you can see they're right by the museum. Yeah. And I'd like to highlight that this is in just a couple of months in one year. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, for just a couple of months, these are all the places that coyote had been. You can kind of see how it ranges along the lakefront, but occasionally it'll go out a little further west. And it seems to stick to one main kind of set of railroad tracks, I believe, as it goes down. So it's really neat. You can see their hab habits, kind of where they range. And again, for the most part, these coyotes have nothing to do with humans. They don't bother us, but they are out hunting little animals and things they want to eat. Anna, any guesses on what they do hunt? Yeah, so we do. Clementine and Christine guessed mice. Jillian says rats. Christina says mice. Luciana guesses rats. So we're on the rodent train. All correct, yeah. They hunt all of those. The one that I was thinking that was very invasive that we want to kind of cut down on the numbers are the rats, but definitely mice too. Yeah, the coyotes can hunt both of those. Those are both great responses and help keep those populations under control of the mice as well. So coyotes can be very helpful. We just have to give some of these creatures our respect and give them some of the space because they have adapted to living with people in the city. So giving them some respect for that and just kind of keeping a distance, especially from the larger animals like coyotes, letting them do their thing. Anna, did we have any a uh, couple more questions? I'm um, I, there was another question, which I know I don't know the answer to, um, and that's if other animals freeze like the wood frog. I believe some bees and insects are like underground, but I don't know if they're like frozen underground or if they're just like dormant in a less yeah. 
icy capacity. Well, as and I think Rebecca could tell you this too, as a bonus, real quick here, if we don't have any other questions, I'll grab one more pelt and I will show you one of the animals that is one of the deepest hibernators for any mammal. It doesn't freeze, but it hibernates very, very deeply. Yeah. And Rebecca did provide us a couple of other things about coyotes, if you were curious to learn more about them. They are one of the few mammals that mates for life. Hmm. They are one of the only mammals that follows rivers and train tracks, which is pretty cool. Neat. Yeah. And we see that on the, the pings on the radios. They follow those train tracks. Really cool. So this animal is a very, very deep hibernator. It does live around here. And it's an animal that you might actually see um, widely publicized on February 2nd. It mm -hmm. might be one of the greatest holiday animals because, you know, Absolutely. They has turkeys, but only one's got a rodent. <laughs> I know. Yeah, rodent holidays are the best. Yes, <laughs> this creature. It's, uh, it hibernates very deeply. I don't know if Rebecca can tell us like how um, much it slows down as far as heartbeat. I don't remember offhand, but it slows down a lot. I think it might be just a, a couple beats a minute, maybe. So much, much deeper than a lot of other mammals, this one hibernates. And we'll see if anyone has a response as we get ready to finish up for today. Yeah, there's a movie about it where you're like trapped in the same day <laughs> over yep. and over again. It goes by many different names. And Here we go. We have one of those names. So Clementine guesses woodchuck, which it is. It's uh, yeah. totally a woodchuck, Clementine, but it also has some other common names. I know we've got a glare here. Sorry, guys. But you here can we go. And Christina says groundhog. Yes, <laughs> both correct. Absolutely. So the day is called Groundhog Day. But yes, a groundhog or woodchuck. It's also known, my favorite name for it is a whistle pig. And yeah, <laughs> it's known by a lot of different names. And you can see here, we've got some of the diorama behind us, which is really pretty cool too. All right, so on that note with Groundhog Day, we are going to get ready to sign off here. I just wanna thank everyone for joining us again for Discovery Adventures. Hope you had a lot of fun. And Anna, what do we have coming up next week? That is a great question. Is next week our oh, timeline? Next week is the timeline, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. I just had to like make sure for myself. So on our next adventure, we're going to be going on a time traveling journey to visualize this um, so that we can actually look through the museum about how far apart different events in time are, when we have dinosaurs, when we have life, when we have humans and all sorts of really exciting kind of benchmarks. So that'll be a really fun journey. So definitely tune in next Tuesday to find your place in the great expanse of time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Stay well. Have a good holiday. Bye, everybody. Take care.